This is the place to find yourself. Istanbul offers great universities and the lifestyle is really amazing here. So I live at the dorms at Maltepe University and I'm really happy with it. There's a cleaning service every few days and then there's the library nearby which is open 24-7. My first impression when I came was like, it's huge. You have everything in one uh, place. When you first come to multiple university, you don't know where what is and you're like, oh my God, I need help. Guess what? You're not alone. There is the international office people over there. They're like family. They're very helpful and they're always there for you. Istanbul is the perfect mixture between ancient and modern. Coming into this city helps me discover myself, learn about so many different cultures, learning about the world, which will help me in writing future books. At Maltepe University, we have a lot of research centers. Because of that, we have the ability to participate in a lot of international projects. Here at Maltepe University, the education consists of both practical and theoretical. We get the opportunity to practice everything we learn in class in real life. So after we graduate, we have a degree and we can work all over the world. People come to Istanbul all the time, but what they really miss when they visit are the antique shops, which contain a thousands of years of memories and also a thread of the modern future. I like to use every minute and just get out and hop on the ferry and just um, go from the Asian side to the European side and just enjoy the wonderful weather with the wonderful Bosphorus behind me and just enjoying the moment of Istanbul. Istanbul is a very beautiful, with great culture. This city is the symbol of diversity. Come and study at Maltepe University. Come here and feel like you're home. Hello everyone, I am Eren. I will be the moderator for this session and welcome to today's third session of our Congress. Before starting, I would like to thank you all for your participation and attendance. I hope it will be a useful Congress for all of us. And if you have any questions about the presentations, you can write it on the comment section that I can forward our question to the presenter. So we start today with our first presenter, Menar Jafri, who is going to talk about IT solutions for safer local train services during COVID-19. Now let's hear it from Menar. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Manar Jafri and I am an undergraduate student studying design at NMIMS School of Design in Mumbai, India. Today, I will be talking about IoT solutions for safer local train services during COVID-19. So let us begin. COVID-19, a term that all of us have become familiar with in the past one year. It is something that has brought small to big changes in the lives of almost everyone across the world. We are all aware of how the pandemic has shook the entire world to its core. Many industries and workspaces were forced to shut down and the impact of the pandemic was so devastating that the entire world hit the pause button. From schools to offices to public places, everything came to a standstill. In India, Mumbai was found to be the worst affected city, so much so that Mumbai's highest single day spike in COVID-19 cases has reached 11,163. In the year 2020, during the first wave of COVID-19, the impact of the pandemic in India was so drastic that even the local trains, which were Mumbai's lifeline, that served millions of people in the city every day, that kept the city going for decades, came to a halt. Mumbai's local trains are the primary mode of commute for millions of people across the city. From students to office-going people to essential workers, the train network has been serving a large number of people in the city for decades. Before the pandemic, approximately 7.6 million people traveled by local trains daily and 2.4 billion annually. 
during the first wave of COVID-19 pandemic in India, these trains were made operational only for the essential workers. However, as the city started seeing a drop in the daily rise in COVID-19 cases, the trains were once again operational for everyone, including the general public, starting from February 1, 2021. But now, as the country is witnessing a second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has become more than essential to ensure that social distancing norms are followed diligently by the people associated with the local train sector. However, if the sector continues working without making any changes in the system, then ensuring physical distancing would be nearly impossible. This is because railway employees engage in a number of tasks, which include operating signals, repairing faulty tracks, collecting and selling tickets, coordinating the activities of the trains, and so on. Moreover, the passengers also spend hours on the platforms and come in contact with fellow passengers. Another problem is overcrowding. Even when the local train services in Mumbai were operational only for the people who work in essential services, on 29th September 2020, the same station platforms and trains saw passengers stuck there in large numbers after trains were cancelled owing to heavy rains and flooding in Mumbai. After water started accumulating on tracks, passengers were stuck at the station platforms. It was also stated by railway officials that owing to heavy rainfall, there was overcrowding of commuters at doorways as well. This incident could have very well been prevented if the passengers were informed well in time about the cancellation of train services. Another issue is railway accidents. The Mumbai local is a highly extensive railway network operating 2,342 train services. This railway network is one of the busiest commuter rail systems in the world. However, it also lacks basic safety mechanisms and public awareness about railroad safety is quite low. On an average, 2,000 people die annually on the Mumbai local train platforms due to overcrowding, trespassing, falling off trains, electrocution, etc. But a shockingly large number of these accidents occur due to trespassing alone. In the past three years, as many as 30,000 people have succumbed to death on the railway tracks as a result of trespassing. Now, although these railway accidents are not directly linked with the COVID-19 pandemic, they are still a matter of grave concern and must be looked into. Hence, in order to tackle these issues and to ensure safety, it is imperative that the railway sector resorts to measures that will not only help ensure the safety of everyone involved in the local train services during COVID-19, but also prepare them to tackle any similar situation in the future. This is where IoT, that is Internet of Things, would come into play. IoT devices like sensors are used to collect, analyze, and transfer data over a wireless connection without human intervention. This technology would allow railway authorities to work contactless and maintain social distancing by making use of sensors and other equipment connected via the internet or any alternate means of communication. This would help reduce manual work and get more work done by fewer people, thereby reducing physical contact. Currently, there are lesser people available for work due to sickness or self-isolation or social distancing protocols. These shortages, if not completely, then can be partly overcome by making use of IoT devices. This means that the railway employees will not have to close a line for hours in order to send an engineer on the railway to examine if anything is wrong, followed by sending a second engineer to determine the problem and another one to actually resolve it. 
integrating IoT devices on railway tracks will allow monitoring them from behind a desk. With the help of IoT, infrastructure can be monitored and inspected remotely without any physical contact between employees. This would require engineers to go onto the tracks only for maintenance or actual repairs, thereby reducing unnecessary physical contact. Sensors installed on railway tracks would allow remote collection and analysis of data on the track conditions, track stress, and temperature, which would reduce the time it takes while examining these conditions with human intervention. If there is a problem with the tracks, the operators can make informed decisions and take preemptive measures for safer operations. There are numerous ways in which employees can remotely determine the maintenance status of trains and railway tracks using various sensors. The technique of image capturing can be used to monitor the arrival and departure of trains. It is an already existing technique, which makes it easier for railway employees to work at home. With the use of eddy current, damage to the tracks, which is smaller than 5 millimeters, can be accurately measured. Automatic recognition of track damage is also possible through installation of sensors on railway tracks. By using IoT devices and sensors, the railway employees can track trains across networks and process data. This would allow operators to check the flow of passengers and determine how many are traveling in coaches, how many are waiting at stations, and at what time the flow of passengers is at the peak. All of this data will help in efficiently scheduling the trains, keeping in mind the safety of the commuters, and also help in determining whether social distancing protocols are being diligently followed. Smart gates or smart alarms. These gates signal red or raise alarms when a train is within a certain distance. They make use of IoT sensors to receive alerts from a platform. When a train crosses a junction, the status resets and opens the gates. This technology can also be used for automatic train protection, centralized traffic control, and automatic signaling, thereby reducing physical contact among employees. Smart alarms are a step towards reducing accidents caused due to trespassing. These alarms use the sensors on the tracks to receive information and make a sound when a human is on the tracks. Thus making it easier for the train drivers to stop the train in time. Apart from the applications mentioned so far to make the railway services in Mumbai safer during COVID-19, IoT devices can also be used to make travel personalized for passengers. It can aid in taking the passenger experience a step further by understanding the history of the passenger's experience and making significant changes to improve and personalize their travel. The devices can help in making it easy to book tickets and giving scheduling information via smartphones, which would subsequently allow the passengers to be aware about the precise time of arrival of trains in case of delays, thereby preventing them from spending hours on a crowded platform waiting for the train to arrive, unaware about its schedule. The Mumbai local train industry is currently in a position where it can exploit the potential and possibilities of IoT. The time to push further with IoT technology is now. The IT sector in the railways must come together to formulate a solution for the current situation. A crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic can be used in a positive sense to stimulate innovation in the Mumbai local train sector. In order to be viable stakeholders and innovative contributors in the digital future, the railway sector will need to make essential changes in their strategies. If the IoT technology 
is successfully integrated in the Mumbai local train sector, then it will not only benefit the employees and passengers during COVID-19, but will also prepare the sector to tackle any similar situation in the future. With this, we come to an end of the presentation. Thank you all for listening. Okay, I'd like to thank you, Menar, for your presentation and participating in our Congress. Thank you. Thank you, too. And now we'll continue our session with our next presenter, Basmita Ramadan Morsi, who will talk about the dialectics between architectural composition and musical formation. Let's hear it from her. Okay, I will start sharing the screen now. Sharing screen. Is it visual now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, first of all, hello everybody. I'm Bas Muldan, a senior student uh, in the architecture department of the British University in Egypt. Um, my topic is that the case between the architecture composition and the music formation to have an overview understanding which the presentation is coming to. Uh, I'm trying to detect the impact of the music on the architecture building, if it is a subconscious uh, impact or not. So I'm trying to... Uh, first of all, this is the presentation outline. And the flow of the presentation, the methodology I used for the paper consists of three phases. The first one is an inductive one, representing the data collection and reduction to have the criteria of choosing the uh, case studies I will analyze, and the second step is a deductive analysis that consists of selecting case studies and selecting a programs that can convert both art to two dimensional to have a common base to convert uh, architecture uh, buildings that are three dimensional art with a musical which has an oral art which has uh, one uh, dimension, and finally analyze both of them, then to final uh, stage with the comparative analysis by explaining the similarities and difference that are observed from the deductive analysis and comparing two uh, both together uh, by using the measurement rule observed or concluded from the inductive phase, mainly in the 19th century, which the both cases are relating or linked to it. The first section I will discuss, what is the art? Art is a um, several molars or a combination between several molars that has a sublime machine we're aiming to improve the life quality for the individual or for the countries. Arts are complementary for each other or the, for their individual uh, life task. And it's a, considered as a common language that can be used over all the world and uh, to understand each one without using a specific word or specific language. Why I choose music to compare it with architecture since both of them has a similar characteristic, like both of them are a dynamic art that is changing to cope the global movement down for each uh, so each country or its century or its state, age, both of them representing the culture and the heritage of the countries. If, for example, if we hear the old music, we can recognize it belongs to the Middle East uh, countries, or we are looking at this picture, you know, it's a European architecture. Actually, the human uh, relating his emotions and memories with both arts, and the most important point that the both arts has an impact on the human nervous system that can reflect on the, his uh, attention or the reflect or reaction on uh, uh, on anything and its attitude. By studying the timeline and the development for the post art, we can easily to be observed that in post arts, um, they are starting the 15th century, are aligned to each other in their development and coping each other. But we can't consider every uh, building or every music as a musical work or as an artistic work. It should have some characteristic that actually common between the both arts, two, both of them must be durable, rememberable, uh, um, should have a message and behavior that should be delivered, and it shouldn't meet and um, cope with the need, expectation of the end user and his expectations. Then how the art are forming, firstly. Generally, the art can be formed by using the our inspired by the nature, like the flow of water, the dynamic shape of the mountains, or the sound or the voice of birds, or complementary our interaction between the art style. 
For example, if you have an individual painting and performing show, it can create a theatrical scene. But to be more focusing for the chosen arts, the musical formation uh, done by the usage of the seven basic tones to generate a musical sentence called melody. By differing or changing this ordering between the seven notes, it's given totally different music or totally, totally different sentence. On the other hand, architectural composition based on the interrelation and the ordering of its basic units that forming our uh, concert as a uh, masses, openings, or even the textures. Also, by differing the ordering, it gives a different physical environment. So, is the report both arts depending on the orientation and the relation between its basic elements? Both of them have an, uh, types of the forming elements, which consider as a measurement ruler I will use for the comparative analysis between the both arts. But firstly, you should explain or uh, discuss which is the meaning of each one. First one, the rhythm, which is the regular and the irregular ordering for the elements, can be in pace or in basic unit elements for the architecture. Based on the tempo, we can consider it as a time in the music and a distance in the architecture work. It has a four types that expand, expand example for the alternating one. Harmony is the uses of the motifs to create a cohesiveness in the artwork. Even in the architecture on music, it, it gradient from the integration to the disappearance according to the age and the design of or the creativity of or the artwork. The third one is a melody, which consists of serial series of tones or elements, it has a duration or the variation in intensity. Actually, it has mainly two types: conjunction and disjunction, uh, depend on the silence or the uh, spacing between the forming elements. Dynamic, which is the movement of the artwork, which attracts the human attention and gives the feeling of the hyper and the, and the, the feeling of um, the activity in the world. Artwork it varies from the minimum, which is PP, and to the maximum FF. It can be used in music as a loudness and quietness of the sound, or in the architecture as a scale of masses or openings. Uh, texture is the uniformity and the appearance of the material or the melody or the tones actually in the music. It can be monophonic for the single use of texture or polyphonic when you use more than one uh, or two uh, texture and the homophonic when you use one main texture and the supporting one. The final forming element is the symmetry, which is the equal balance or will proportion and will balance between the masses in their architecture all the melodies. It has a various type, but the most common used in the post arts, the plenary form and the ternary form. Uh, briefly, plenary form, we have, when you have uh, typically two parts, they are married to each other, like expand in the example, or ternary form when you have a third part in the middle, which has a totally different uh, idea or uh, message. And Firstly, we uh, conclude that what the meaning of these uh, features elements, and we will use it by uh, to analyze each case study. The criteria of choosing case study for the music, for example, are trying to reach um, a music that are commonly heard and considered as iconic symphony that durable till now, which can, uh, which is the the Blue Danube for John Sturles. Uh, I start to analyze it, so I found that it had. He used a maxing between a uh, type of rhythm, which is the in uniform rhythm and alternating rhythm. The harmony was simplicity, no more tones interacting with each other. It's clearly to find and hear the silence between each uh, part in the, in the symphony, and the dynamic are changeable from the quiet and slowly music and or tone to the loud and quick one. The texture he used um, mainly string section sounds and added some of one's wood sections. The symmetry I used to A, then B, then re reverse to the A section again to have some sort of different messages, different emotions in the, his musical note. And for architecture, I choose uh, opera houses sense. It's the main, it's, it's the main where with both arts are interacting or supporting or facing each other. I'm choosing the Al uh, Khadiva Opera House in Egypt. It was uh, the iconic building in the first culture picking uh, uh, in the Africa in this century, in the 19th century, and was an Pekin culture building for 102 years till it burned in 1971. By analyzing its openings, columns, motif, material for each one of the six uh, forming elements, as mentioned in the 
uh, deductive uh, stage, we found that by comparing both of them, we found that both are similarly uh, almost identical to each other. It's easy to observe that they are almost identical with their elements and mean the, uh, maybe they're arctic influenced by the heard music or the music and affected by the surrounding art and visual arts around it. In both cases, the impact of both arts can be recognized and observed in the case study and which create the 19 states of art. Thank you. I hope it be worthy and I'm ready to end. Okay. I'd like to thank you for your presentation and participating in our Congress. So we are continuing our session with our next presenter, Yash Guli, who will talk about drones as a mediator for obsolete technology against air pollution introduction. Let's hear it from him. Um, thank you. Hello, my name is Yash Kale and I'm a design student from the NMIM School of Design um, in Mumbai. I will be presenting my white paper, Drones as the Mediator for Obsolete Technology Against Air Pollution. Now, we all are aware of the problems regarding air pollution and it being a major issue. But just to put that into perspective, um, according to the World Health Organization, there are about 4.2 million deaths every year globally due to ambient air pollution. And they stated that in 2016, 91% of the population was situated in areas which did not meet their air quality guidelines. Now it is necessary to talk about this issue because the current technology being used for air pollution control is the problem. The, they've reached the limit of their usefulness because the process parameters that they were developed for initially have changed in recent years, making them ineffective. Now, the problems of this current technology can be broken down into several factors, the first one being the cost. These devices are extremely expensive and involve several elements such as maintenance, fuel for energy, area for installation. And due to the vast amount of elements present as seen in the images on the right, um, the nature of the cost involved is often complex and difficult to determine. Hence, these costs are treated as indirect costs in the production standards of a company. Um, the U.S. federal government estimated the direct expenditure on pollution control to be $50 billion, of which around $31 billion was for air pollution abatement itself. Now, what makes these devices uneconomical is that even though they're so expensive, um, they can only be used for mitigating stationary sources of pollution. They cannot be used to deal with the pollutants that may spread to the surrounding atmosphere and the pre-existing pollutants. The size and quantity of equipment also demands for um, large installation area, which is unfavorable for the environment. And it also demands for more money and power. Talking about power, um, these devices have extremely high power requirements, which only increases with the intensity of the task. And due to these high power requirements, they also include several safety hazards. For example, incinerators involve combustion of pollutants and generate extremely hot surfaces and can develop explosive conditions. Now, while safety of these devices is an issue, the efficiency is also becoming a problem. So the efficiency of these devices depends on the type of pollutant and the process, the performance parameters that it requires. And on an average, these devices achieve an efficiency of 99% infiltration but the problem arises when the process parameters change, which they have in recent years, making these inefficient for filtration. For example, industrial cyclones, which are dust collecting machines, operate to collect large particulate matter, which is typically less than or equal to 50, 50 micrometer in diameter. But this efficiency drops to 90% um, when the particle size is less than or equal to 10 to 20 micrometer in diameter. Um, Talking about data and monitoring, so data is extremely important in today's world, and this is where the current technology falls short. 
these devices can only they only serve the purpose of filtration of pollutants and they provide no data about their performance or effect for air pollution control and this data needs to be acquired from separate monitoring stations such as the 4000 stations set up by the environmental pollution agency of the us which again demands for more space power and uh, money now due to all these problems it's necessary to explore the possibilities of new technology as plausible solutions and drones can be the solution that we have been looking for they are being adopted for various applications such as photography delivery disaster management and their potential for air pollution abatement needs to be explored um now the implementation of drones in air pollution control needs to be approached as a cyber physical system having two main aspects the hardware configuration for drones and a drones um, control system which manages the drone behavior as an example here i will be stating specifications from an experimental research model to provide a basic understanding of this application so a drone has various parts controlling its functioning as shown on the image in the left um, the pixop autopilot is responsible for the drone's physical systems it is a high performance flight control module um, which is used in various autonomous vehicles the raspberry pi is uh, responsible for the drone's guidance system it is one of the most popular single board computers and it allows for integration with various operating systems and exploration of computing in various programming languages now the drones in this um, experimental model are driven using a custom pollution driven uav control algorithm um this algorithm involves two stages the first is the search stage which involves scanning for the maximum amount of air pollutants and the second is the exploration stage which involves scanning the surrounding environments in a spiral motion as shown in the image on the right um to to analyze the pollution conditions of a region um now drones may not be cheap and they can range from $400 to $270,000 but relatively when compared to the existing technology they are a much more cost efficient alternative the advantages and benefits they offer outweigh all costs um coming to mobility and space um, drones are unmanned aerial vehicles which makes them fit for not only mitigating pollutants at the source but also in the surrounding environment and at various altitudes they can be the key to accessing remote inaccessible hazardous areas that humans cannot go to um when it comes to space a uh, base station is um responsible for recharging the drones and a single base station can be home to a swarm of drones which reduces the need for multiple train stations in a, in a region saving on space um, power and money when it comes to power the drone station can be equipped with a solar panel to provide power to the drones and the drones themselves can be equipped with such solar panels to provide them power during their flight for longer monitoring durations this solar energy can also be stored by them for um night time functioning now a drone has various sensors which can help it detect um unfavorable weather conditions and low battery levels which provide safety detection measures for the drone for example the hcsr04 is an ultrasound sensor used for detecting obstacles if an obstacle is less than 35 cm in proximity the drone changes its flight path companies like parazero mass parachute and fruity shoots provide safety technology for sensors to stop the propeller motion which may tangle with the parachute to prevent crash injury um now safety also requires efficiency and performance um the sensors that are used for as safety measures can also be used to measure the air quality health index of a region the air quality health index is a scale that helps to understand the quality of air and also the effects it can have on a person's health now by measuring this air quality health index the drone can determine that if it is higher than the recommended threshold it can deploy the onboard countermeasures For example the abatement solution used for nitrogen dioxide is a scrubbing solution comprised of hydrogen peroxide and nitric acid 
the onboard abatement carried out for NO2 resulted in an AQHI reduction of 0.8 microgram per meter cube for NO2. Now, as I mentioned earlier, data is extremely essential in today's world, and this is where the drones provide the most advantages. Um, the drones are equipped with various sensors which can track the percentage of pollutants and using the onboard GPS shield, an exact the exact location of drones while doing so can be known. Now, the drones can make use of the PDUC algorithm mentioned earlier and this algorithmic cycle repeated by multiple drones, let's say in the form of patrol routes, can lead to the creation of an air quality health index map for the region. As shown, in, as shown in the images on the right. These sensors also analyze the atmospheric weather conditions, which can be correlated with, with weather station data for more accuracy and possibly even remove the need for them, again, saving on space, money, and power. Now, while this technology is extremely promising, it does have certain limitations which will need to be explored. Um, the efficiency of drones can be affected by electronic interference between its parts. And the range for current drones is limited to, five, uh, to 10 kilometers. Also, in reference to the experimental model uh, mentioned earlier, the current storage capacity for drones is limited to 500 ml of abatement solution each for a maximum of seven pollutants. When it comes to recycling, um, this is uh, so some existing technologies have the capability to recycle the extracted pollutants. Um, and for example, electrostatic precipitators, which have a conveyor system to segregate the extracted pollutants either for recycling or disposal, which is yet to be explored in drone technology. Now, drones are a very sophisticated technology which naturally raises security concerns. Um, surveillance, cybersecurity, physical accidents, air traffic, geopolitical tensions are some of the issues that will need to be addressed for the success of this technology. Um, understanding the scope for this technology is important and the market for it is one of the best justifications. The global commercial market for drones was valued at $2.8 billion in 2016 and $5.8 billion in 2018. It has been projected to, it has, the market has been stated to have one of the fastest growth opportunities projected to reach $13 billion between 2016 and 2020. Now, while the personal drone market is 94% of the market sales, it's only responsible for generating 40% of the market revenue. Whereas commercial drones, which is, which are 6% of the market sales are responsible for generating 60% of the revenue. Um, the exponential advance, advancements in today's technology allows for integration between them, which can take the performance of drones to untapped potentials. Um, advancements in augmented reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things can lead to the creation of an autonomous system for drones, as shown in the image on the right, which is a patent filed by Amazon in 2017, showing a beehive-like drone structure. Also, um, South Korea launched the geostationary environment monitoring spectrometer and technology like this working in integration with drones can lead to higher accuracy of data when it comes to geo mapping and analyzing pollution conditions. Now, the existing technologies have been around for a long period of time um, with very few advancements, making them ineffective today and drones equipped with the advancements of today's technology can lead to the creation of a harmonious system providing continuous real-time data for analyzing pollution conditions and mitigating them and there needs to be a technocentric approach for their societal acceptance thank you okay yes thank you for your attendance and your presentation thank you and now we are continuing with our next presenter, Tanushree Hamedeka, who will talk about Kabul Sport at your service. Now let's hear it from her. Uh, 
Uh, hello everyone, this is Tanushree Hanmatekar and I am a design student from NMIM School of Design, Mumbai from India. Today I am here to present my paper on the topic Cobots 4.0 at your service. This presentation would include the aims and purpose of my research, the problem addressed, the solution offered and the call to action required. The fact the four aims and purpose that my white paper focuses on is one to highlight the increasing automation in different sectors of various industries including healthcare agriculture etc next to showcase the problem of unemployment in the food and beverage industry due to automation next to explain what are cobots and how they are different from the regular industrial robots and the last one is to explain the benefits of cobots and how they can be used in the food and the beverage industry. Now, industrial automation is the use of control systems such as computers or robots for handling various tasks and to replace human beings. Now, they are also used in different sectors apart from manufacturing like transporting, packaging, etc. Yes. Automation had various advantages when deployed in workplaces, like they were cost effective. Automation was considered as a strategic investment than expenditure, because once the initial implementation costs are covered, they prove to be of a worthy investment. Automating redundant activities like reduces the need for extensive labor, minimizes paperwork, expenses, etc. Secondly, automation saves time. It simplifies day to day recurring activities and carries out a task in less than half the time a human being would take. Next, accuracy and consistency. A huge drawback that is associated with manual processing is there is a possibility of errors, especially when there are huge volumes involved. But automation eliminates the chances of errors, leading to enhanced accuracy. Now, just like the other industries, the food and beverage industry also incorporated automation in various sectors like manufacturing, packaging, etc. Food industrialists actually reported a 25% increase in productivity after employing robots as compared to when the task was carried out by humans. In the past decade, a lot of changes were brought in this industry, from kiosks taking orders, automated trucks delivering food, etc. Now, these emerging technologies offloaded labor onto robots, which possessed great threats to food industry workers. Also, labor represented about 30% of the cost of running a restaurant, and cutting those costs gave the businessmen a tremendous opportunity to earn profits. With developments in technology, automation was not only limited to sectors like packaging, palletizing, transportation, etc., but also shifted in the cooking sector of this industry. Yes, that's true. A robot could actually carry out the art of cooking to complete perfection. An art like cooking, which actually involves the emotional aspect of human beings, was carried out by robots to complete accuracy. This white paper focuses on this particular industry because now automation has also aced in a sector which involves the emotional ability of humans. Automation in the cooking sector of this industry began right from 1897 when the first semi-automated restaurant was opened. In this restaurant, the people would place an order through a machine and then the chef, the chef behind would prepare it. The food used to be delivered through an another high-tech machine. This can still be considered as semi-automation since, since it involved a human chef. But as technology progressed, restaurants started becoming fully automated. This led to certain disadvantages. One such example was the restaurant Spice, started by 
started in Boston by four MIT technical engineering students. Let's have a look at how the restaurant actually functions. As you could see here, that the robot didn't, didn't involve any people in the process of cooking. Michael Farad, Brady Knight, Luke Skelter, and Kale Rogers developed this kitchen using seven autonomous workstations to prepare bowl-based meals in three minutes or less. Now, this possessed a very big disadvantage to the industry. which was unemployment. Now, since robots and high-tech machinery are being used to cater out tasks, unemployment was a major problem that was caused. But an another angle to this problem was that automation had many advantages like more productivity, precision, etc., which made it unavoidable and hence it cannot be completely disregarded. Automation accounts for a high percent of unemployment among many sectors as seen in the diagram, including the food and beverage industry. The situation was already worsening and now the COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impacted the situation. Because of social distancing and other precautions related to employee and patron health and safety, many industries have to shut down or work at a reduced capacity, which has led to several losses to the industry. Concerns about the pandemic and the necessity of maintaining food supply chains have pushed many businesses in the industry to increase their investments in automating or using AI technologies. The food and industry being a complex network of various business, businesses like agriculture, food processing, packaging, palletizing, picking, production, etc. Today has expanded ranging from small scale industries to large scale highly mechanized industries. Hence, a lot of people have become involved in the process inevitably. And hence, there is no scope for trial and error because besides causing losses to the industry, it could affect the health of the consumers and could prove dangerous. Hence, and also since food is one of the basic necessities of human beings, it was necessary to achieve perfection while increasing production at the same time. Hence, as seen in the diagram, automation has increased over the years in various sectors of the industry. Now, since people couldn't be left unemployed and needed to be given a source of living, and at the same time, automation couldn't be completely neg neglected because of the advantages it provides, a middle way needed to be found that satisfies both the sides of the problem. And hence, with the advancing technology, a new type of robot has been introduced, which are known as cobots. Cobots, namely collaborative robots, as the name suggests, are designed to collaborate with humans to enhance their abilities and not replace them completely. With robots assisting humans and any job can be carried out with more precision and pace. Cobots are essentially robots that are meant to physically interact with humans in a shared workplace. They serve as tools for for, opera for operations and not devices that replace human workers completely.
The use of cobots in the food and beverage industry continues to grow with increasing opportunities and uses. As you can see here, cobots can be used for collection and placement of objects, packaging products to prevent them from damage during transport, placing products on pallets for transportation, and also for quality control checks. In a video shown previously, we saw that how robots had completely taken over a restaurant and hence unemploying humans completely. But now, since cobots are being incorporated into restaurants, we can clearly see the difference. One such example is the robotic arm Flippy. Let's see how it works. As seen as the video, Flippy is a robot that cooks burgers at Cali Burger with mastery. As you can see, Cali Burger doesn't aim for its outlets to be entirely taken over by robots. Flippy, in fact, lets the human employees spend more time engaging with the consumers. This is a cobotic working arrangement. The restaurant has stated that they still need people even in the kitchen to manage the robotic system. Now, certain advantages that cobotic systems offer are more productivity. Since robots don't experience fatigue, they can continuously perform activities that are particularly strenuous and don't require decision making. Next, they are easy to use and require only few hours to set up. There is reduction of inactivity as cobots bring down the production change down to a few minutes instead of several hours. Cobots can free humans from dangerous tasks and hence humans can engage in more skill-based tasks. A very important advantage provided by cobots is that they, it has reduced employee turnover. Since many enterprises have experienced a reduction in employee turnover since the introduction of cobots, executing recovering activities on a daily basis gets mundane and monotonous for employees. Cobots solve this problem and allow people to take up more challenging and rewarding activities. And hence, their, their employees are more satisfied with their work. Satisfied employees tend to perform better and stay with organizations for a longer time. To conclude the presentation, seeing how cobots can solve the problem of unemployment while simultaneously pro providing the benefits of automation, we should promote the use of cobots and include retraining the employees as a part of their everyday job to ensure that the companies have the necessary skills developed for the future. A Deloitte study of automation in the UK found that robots and cobots in particular create more and often better paying jobs than actually eliminating them, improve productivity and also increase competitiveness, which are all great reasons for companies to encourage the use of cobots. Since automation is slowly becoming an inevitable part of our everyday industry, we must learn how to use it to the best of its potential and achieve our maximum capabilities. Thank you, and the cobots will always be at your service. Okay, Tanushri, thank you for your presentation and participating in our Congress. 
And now, um, finally, we are continuing our session with our last presenter. But unfortunately, uh, Theodoros Kalibas, he won't be able to present it live because of his internet connection problem. So we are going to share a video of the presentation that Theodoros prepared in advance. So here comes the video. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Theodoros uh, Kalibas, and I am a doctoral uh, student in the Hellenic Open uh, University. Our uh, work is about the proposed temperature extremes index, uh, which is based on uh, Fourier harmonic analysis. Climate change leads to changes in the intensity, duration, and frequency of uh, weather extremes. Due to their major consequences, the estimation of the weather extremes trends is very important. A method for uh, monitoring changes in weather extremes is through the use of indices. In the present work, we propose a new index for the study of climate extremes and climate variability. This index combines uh, the results of uh, Fourier harmonic analysis with statistical uh, measures which indicate temperature extremes. Temperature data uh, are from two stations of the Hellenic National Meteorological Service Network, uh, which have extreme values. Uh, one station, Florina, is located in the colder northern region of Greece, uh, while the other one, Timbaki, is in the warmer southern part in the island of Crete. Their data cover a nearly 50-year period. Initially, daily average values for both stations and for all years are calculated. These values are the observed temperature values. Using the daily average values, a Fourier harmonic analysis is performed next. From the results of the harmonic analysis, we compose uh, the Fourier series, uh, which uh, represents an optimum approximation of the real data time series. Uh, through the Fourier series, we calculate the temperature values for each day and for each year. These values are the theoretical temperature values. Finally, we calculate the index value for each day by subtracting the one value from the other and by squaring the result. Summing all the daily index values, we obtain the yearly value of index. N equals to 365 uh, is the number of days of a year, uh, or N equals to 366 for the leap years. Here is a diagram about the evolution of the yearly average temperature for the two stations. Uh, the average temperature of Timbaki is uh, about 5 to 10 degrees higher than that of Florina. Uh, the yearly average temperature is constantly increasing uh, in Timbaki station. Uh, the trend is increasing. There is a cooling trend for Florina uh, until the late 70s, but after that period, uh, the main trend is warming. Florina's trend shows a constant decrease after the year 2000. Uh, here is a diagram about the evolution uh, of uh, standard deviation of temperature values. Florina, which uh, has lower average annual temperature than Timbaki, uh, shows much higher uh, standard deviation values than Timbaki, uh, from uh, 1 to 5 degrees. Uh, we notice a decreasing trend uh, in Florida until the late uh, 70s, uh, then the trend is increasing. 
την Bucky Station shows a more stable and slightly increasing trend for the whole period. There is a general increasing variability over time for both stations. Here is the annual evolution uh, of the daily average temperature values uh, for Florina Station and for uh, three selected years, 1982, 1994 and uh, 2013. Uh, we notice uh, that uh, the temperature fluctuations uh, are more uh, pronounced uh, in 2013 uh, comparing to the older years. Uh, this diagram uh, shows the evolution of the daily average temperature values uh, for Timbaki Station and for uh, the selected years uh, 1982, 1994 and 2011. As in the case of Florina, uh, we notice uh, that uh, the temperature fluctuations uh, are more prominent in the recent years. In this uh, diagram, uh, we see a comparison between observed and the theoretical values for Florina and for the selected year 2002. Uh, the theoretical values uh, which derive from the Fourier series is the blue line, a fit good on the observed data, red line. Uh, we also notice uh, that uh, there are uh, prominent uh, fluctuations, uh, especially in winter. This diagram is about uh, the comparison between observed uh, and uh, we notice uh, prominent fluctuations of uh, temperature, uh, especially in summer. This uh, plot uh, is about uh, the evolution of the percentage of the variance explained from the first harmonic term of the Fourier series for both stations. We notice that the percentage of Timbaki is greater than that of Florina, uh, which indicates that the annual cycle, the annual meteorological cycle, is uh, stronger in the case of Timbaki. We see now the evolution of the calculated index uh, for both stations. We notice uh, that Florina shows a decreasing trend uh, until the late uh, 70s, uh, then the trend is increasing until about 2000 and uh, decreases again. Uh, the trend for Timbaki uh, overall is uh, slightly increasing. Uh, index values for Florina are greater uh, than those of Timbaki, uh, indicating uh, greater differences between observed and theoretical temperature values. And some uh, conclusions uh, which can be drawn. Uh, the proposed index uh, showed trends uh, which are similar with the climatic futures uh, of the selected stations. The index uh, must be studied uh, in relation uh, with statistical measures which express uh, variability and especially climate extremes. Also, future work uh, using more meteorological stations is needed in order to ascertain whether the proposed index is uh, suitable uh, for the quantification of climate variability. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Theodore. Uh, at first, you're welcome to our broadcast.
and thank you for your presentation and participating in our Congress. Uh, thank you very much too. And that concludes the session. Thank all participants as well as your audience for their attention. It was an honor to have you with us. Thank you so much.